Now, I must confess before I uh, begin this morning um, that as I prepared in the past few weeks uh, for this series in the Easter season on creation and the environment and our stewardship about it, that I had a rather startling revelation, a self-revelation that I had not really contemplated or thought much about. And that startling revelation was this, that in the many years I have preached, uh, and I don't like to count those years, uh, but in the many years I've preached, I don't think I have ever preached a sermon on the environment and stewardship of the environment. And I was rather saddened by that. I have put uh, lines in sermons about our responsibility uh, to creation around us. I put lines about our own kind of human um, capacity to, to ruin the environment, the sin of that. I put lines in sermons uh, referring to climate change and things like that, but I have never, ever simply focused on this idea. And I was kind of startled by that. Now, as I think about it, there are a number of reasons probably why that's so. Uh, one is that while I've done some reading on the subject to magazines and newspapers, um, I don't really know a lot about the environment and nature. Uh, I don't have a lot of knowledge about that, but the truth is um, that's true a lot of Sundays in which I preach. I don't really have much knowledge of the subject anyway, so that really shouldn't hold me back. As I thought about it, what, what, might have, what might be keeping me from, if the past, from, from wrestling with this question of the environment and nature and climate change? And uh, one of the things that occurs to me is that it just seems like such, so huge, so, so big, there's no way to really wrap our mind around it. This challenge facing us these days, this reality of climate change in the environment. And so in some ways, it's kind of difficult to speak to because it is so big, <laughs> so overwhelming, so impossible to think about or how we might respond to it. And, uh, you know, to be honest, part of the reason maybe I've resisted doing that is because, I mean, it's kind of depressing, let's face it, right? <laughs> kind of feels kind of scary as we talk about the environment and the, the crisis facing us as human beings um, in climate change and those things. I know part of the reason probably I've resisted is because something, this is a topic that's become kind of a political hot topic and often we feel more divided on the question than united and that's, and that's difficult uh, to preach about and wrestle with. Uh, because it has become this kind of political football that divides us rather than connects us. But really, it's kind of depressing. It's kind of scary stuff um, to think about and reflect upon uh, and the challenges before us. And I'll be honest, you know, it's kind of, I've always shied away from sermons that were depressing. Right? It usually doesn't really connect to people, right? Um, you know, I don't like those sermons that, uh, you know, guilt-inducing, uh, we're all going to hell sermons. That's just not my preaching style, right? I'm not, I, I don't identify with a guy who's standing at the corner with a sign that says this is the end. So there are a lot of reasons, probably over the years, I've never really tried to wrestle with this topic or think about to any great extent. And the truth is, I'm actually not alone as a clergy person. There was actually, and, and let me use these quotes, these statistics to you, there was actually a study done by Lifeway, a Christian nonprofit organization, that says the majority of Protestant pastors, 52%, address environmental issues once a year or less. I bet it was last 
I bet it was Earth Day, Sunday, is the only time these clergy will talk about this thing. And what was interesting, 11% said they've never heard the clergy person ever speak to them about the environment. Another survey conducted by the Public Research Institute, the Academy of Religion, indicates that six in 10 Americans say their clergy leader rarely, 29%, or never, 33%, references climate change. Maybe for all the reasons I said, not knowledgeable, it seems so big, it's such a political hot subject, it's, it's so scary and depressing. But I was startled to discover that actually in the studies done by sociologists among, uh, uh, in, done in this country indicate that the person in the pew is less concerned or less engaged on environmental issues than someone who's non-religious. That's kind of startling to think about, isn't it? And actually, there are some studies indicating that we in the pews are less concerned or less, less engaged on ecological, environmental issues than a person who doesn't even come to church. And I mean, I guess we clergy are, should be to blame. But actually, I would posit to you this morning this truth that there is something inherent about our theology, about how we see the world as Christians that hinder our ability to engage on the environment. That really, a significant part of our struggle as Christians is bad theology. So the passage I read today, uh, I'll go over again. Uh, Let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the wild animals of the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. Let us, God gives us dominion. And then further on in the passage, God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every other living thing that moves upon the earth. Don't you see the problem? Dominion and subjugation. It's there. Right there at the very beginning of our scriptures. And to be honest, it's quite often that this story, this text, is proof text all the time to support a kind of attitude toward nature and God's created world in which we see nature existing and its only value being for what we get out of it, right? that nature or God's creation exists for us to oversee and have dominance over and to subdue and use. Its only value is what we can make of it and what we create with it, what we might profit by it. So essentially, nature exists For us. Now, it's a much bigger problem for us, this problem of domination and subjugation, in part because much of our theology, let's be honest, is very human-centered, isn't it? Salvation understood in terms of my individual soul. God's love for humanity, which is good news and grace but we never talk 
about God's creation. Or at least we tend to see it as something lesser than us. Now, what's interesting is often is that text, and it's quoted often by those who would, who would say that's what the, who, who would proof text this opening story and say, domination and subjugation of God's creation. God gave us that. Well, the truth is the Hebrew words are far more subtle and far more difficult to translate than that concept of domination and subjugation. That in fact, it has more a connotation of a kind of skilled mastering, a kind of skilled oversight, not over creation, but the, there is actually a preposition that it's with creation, a kind of partnership. And yet our English word dominion seems to imply it exists underneath us. And that bad theology has shaped thousands of years in which we are not connected to nature and creation, but separate. Now, I'm not going to get into the weeds too much today, but actually, you may not be aware, there are actually two stories in creation. Biblical scholarship shows this to us. There are actually two stories that are weaved together. If one read the first few chapters of Genesis, one would see two accounts kind of interconnected together, which are two accounts of creation. The one, I will talk about the second one next week, but this week, this version of the creation story, which uses words like domination and subjugation, come from what we call the priestly tradition. Very concerned with hierarchical kinds of relationships. Emphasizes certain things as opposed to the, the other story, which I'll share next week, in which it's far more connected across rather than up and down. And the truth is that the assumption that nature exists just for our use, that the environment exists just for us to over, oversee and to use for our means of survival and um, for us to use, actually is contradictory with the rest of the story of creation. Nature's goodness God says, is the very existence. For God looks each and ends each and every day, looks out at what God has created, sky and earth and oceans and animals, and over and over God says, what? It is good in and of itself. Its value isn't related to a human being. Its value is goodness in and of itself. And somehow, in our tradition, our faith tradition, we've forgotten that. Now, in the coming weeks, I'm sure, we're going to offer different ideas about things we can take, do as individuals, important things, recycling, some of the ideas the kids uh, were very aware of, things, uh, picking up trash, there's some individual things, reusing, you know, you, bringing your own bags to the grocery store. I mean, there are all kinds of practical ideas and things we should engage in uh, as individuals to show our commitment to that. And those are good things, and I'm sure we'll cover those. I'm sure in the coming weeks we'll talk a little bit about things we can advocate for in our communities and uh, in the midst of, of the challenges facing us in our communities, things we can advocate for as, as good citizens to improve our environment. And I'm sure we'll have some ideas about that. And we'll, we'll talk about that, better fuel efficiency, uh, uh, maybe better development of green resources, those kinds of things. Those will be offered ideas that we might reflect on, but I want to offer you a far deeper and far harder challenge in the coming weeks. 
I want to say to you, and to myself, to be quite honest, we need changed hearts. A transformed consciousness about nature and creation itself. That ultimately, we're not going to be able to have hope or begin to address some of the bigger challenges until we change. Not simply in what we do, but how we experience God in the world around us. That the challenge isn't simply doing things, it's reimagining ourselves in relation to nature and creation around us in new and much more profound ways. There's a quote, um, and, and you'll see this more often than not, by a number of scientists who will write about climate change and the environment and the crisis facing them. And over and over again, what they will say is it isn't, I mean, we have possibilities for addressing this. We have ideas, we have technologies that can begin to really make a change and really, really uh, affect the future, not only of ourselves, but our children and our grandchildren, that we do have the resources for this, but what's missing is the spiritual revolution. And they'll say, Religion, in many ways, is much of the cause of what we face. In many ways, is the only way we can solve it. So my prayer for you and me this week is the transformation of our hearts and our minds in which we encounter the goodness of creation around us simply not for what it does for us, but because it is good. My prayer for you in the coming weeks in this season of resurrection is that our hearts and our spirits can be raised so that we see the world differently. And we ourselves are transformed in the depths of our hearts and minds. My prayer for us in the coming weeks is that you'll take a walk in the woods, talk to a tree, that you'll, that you'll work in your garden and pause in the midst of it and feel the beauty and love of nurturing that garden. It would, my prayer for you and me is that we would go forth and watch the beauty of the sky and to celebrate the goodness of this earth and to know our connection to everything that is created. Now, we have set our mission as a community here at Heartland. We have set our mission, and we've said it rather plainly. It's to connect to God, to connect to each other, and to connect to the other. Maybe our mission in the coming weeks is to connect to that other, which is creation which is this beautiful world around us. My prayer for us in the season of resurrection is that we truly might be changed. To God be the glory this day and forevermore. Amen.